Good morning and welcome to our service here in Green Island and Ballycarry Presbyterian Churches. It is great to have you with us here this morning. We are continuing our series and looking at uh, some of the theology of the church through the idea of cafe theology uh, and that we make some of the theology of our church um, familiar to us and, and, and every day to us and stuff that we can chat about over a coffee. Uh, and today we've got to study it a bit and get to grips with it. So we've looked at creation. Uh, today we look at the second part of the fall, which actually holds some seeds of great hope. So today's service should be a service of great hope. Um, and you kind of think, well, the fall, what's that got to do with hope? Well, watch later on and find out as we start to unpack um, uh, some of chapter 3 of Genesis again, which is great and is exciting. Um, just to keep an eye really on information coming out of both of our churches, uh, the church magazine from Green Island will be coming out in the next couple of weeks and that will be coming to your doors. Uh, so keep an eye out for that and a big thank you to Alex and her team who have pulled that together into a, a phenomenal magazine actually. Uh, you kind of would have thought in COVID that would be less, but actually it's, it's brilliant and we hear some of our voices of how the season has been going. Ballycarry, we continue to process or, or move down the road uh, towards a hearing candidate, a hearing a candidate for the vacancy and there will be information coming out of our church uh, fairly immediately in regard to that so um, folks will be getting in touch and contacting us about where we're at and how we're moving forward in that uh, which means there are exciting days for our church in Ballycarry as well. Cap collection continues here in Green Island, uh, just at the doors of the office, continue to leave the food there. Uh, and we get that down to Jackie uh, with Christians Against Poverty. Um, so really what we're for looking in case you're not totally sure, so it'll be dried goods, you know, our rices, our pastas, uh, tinned vegetables, tinned meat, um, cereals, uh, washing powder, toiletries, uh, all that, all that sort of side of sort of side of life stuff that won't go off that you know that families will use, and there's baskets there. Put it in there, and we'll get that out to families that need it at this time. I wanted to start with a psalm of praise today, and I was looking through, and Psalm eighty one caught my eye, uh, because it's actually a psalm that really the church is getting told off, uh, because it's not listening to God, uh, but it starts in praise. And it reminds me that even in days where we're far from God or close to God, or if we're in good days or difficult days, that regardless of our circumstances or how we feel, we should be always coming to God in praise. And so we're reminded that the sort of a difficult psalm for the people to hear, it still says this, Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. So, okay, Israel's not where it should be. But the psalmist encourages him still. Praise the Lord. Shake the tambourine, play the lyre, blow the trumpet on the festival days. Well, let's do the same as we move now into worship. Let's sing our first hymn together. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the bridge of life are ransomed, shed for us his precious blood. Yeah. 
So first of all, we'll do our reading, which recaps some of what we've already read in the book of Genesis. Uh, and then following straight after we've had the reading, we're going to move into some of our prayers. And this morning, we're particularly going to focus on simply our own families. Sometimes we feel that we're always praying for issues overseas or big national issues. Um, and so maybe we want to take an opportunity today and pray for some issues that we have personally closer to home. And so we'll take some time to pray over our own families today. But first, let's read the word of God. And we move uh, still through chapter 3 of the book of Genesis and the account of the fall. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, and we're going to read through to verse 21. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. 
And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. We pray that God will bless this reading of his word to us this morning. Now let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you give us the great privilege of calling uh, ourselves daughters and sons of the King. You have brought us into your family. And as you have brought us in, Father, we want to bring our families into the throne room in prayer before you. Father, we recognise that family is often complicated. And family are often the people we carry on our heads and our hearts most. And so we bring them before you this morning. Lord, we want to pray for those in our families that we love who are struggling with health problems. Maybe have done for years, Father, or maybe new issues and problems have arisen recently. Lord, we pray for your healing. As we consider this fall and the brokenness of everything, we pray for your restoration. Not just over our spirits, but over our bodies. Lord, where it is your will, lay your hand upon our families, bodies, and restore and rejuvenate and heal. Father, we also pray for our family members who may be struggling in difficulty in relationships, which can be fraught in our families. We pray for where there may be crisis in regard to jobs and money, particularly in the season we're in. We pray for our family members who may be at risk of losing their jobs. And through that, other things may become at risk. Our homes, cars. So Father, we pray for our family members who may be struggling at this time in relationship and financially. Father, we also want to take time and pray for our family members this morning who do not know you and do not acknowledge you as their Lord and Saviour. We pray that we may be a witness to them. Equip us, Father, to reveal Jesus to those that we meet week in, week out, day in, day out in our families. Provide opportunities for us to share Jesus with our family members, Father, in a way that is meaningful and relates to them. Give us courage, Father, because sometimes our families are the hardest people we have to speak to in faith. So give us courage where we need it, Lord, that we may share Jesus. Father, we place our family in your care and ask that you move according to your spirit. In Christ's name, amen.
I was brought up as a fan of Bob Dylan. Uh, my father clearly didn't hate me enough, so he inflicted me with the growler uh, that is Bob Dylan. And in the 1989 Oh Mercy album, Dylan kind of continued to work out some of his faith and his thinking. He produced three phenomenal, you know, powerful Christian albums that I really I'd encourage you to listen to. Um, but his, his thinking around faith became more reflective as he got older. And the Oh Mercy albums, uh, it's a phenomenal album. It, include, it includes like songs about the devil, uh, the man in the long black coat it's called. He questions his own goodness in, in a song called What Good Am I? But there's one song that has always struck a chord for me. And it's because it kind of repeats the sort of refrain over and over and over again. In the song, Dylan seemed to look around the world and be struck by the brokenness of everything around him. And in the song, simply called or titled Everything Is, is Broken, he sings this. Broken hands on broken ploughs, broken treaties, broken vows. Like, was Dylan ever any more relevant to our EU debate at the minute? Broken pipes, broken tools, people bending broken rules, hound dog howling, bullfrog croaking, everything is broken. Ain't no use jiving, ain't no use joking, everything is broken. It's a pretty bleak song, isn't it? A lot of comedy. But that doesn't mean it's not true. Dylan looks around at his personal life, his working life, at political life, and he comes to the conclusion simply that everything around him is broken. And it's the same conclusion we come to as we work through our passage this morning. And we see brokenness in this passage at different levels. And we want to look at that first this morning. The big thing that we see within this passage is broken relationships. There are broken relationships on a number of different levels in this passage. Unknown to Adam and Eve, they break their relationship between themselves and God. In disobeying and rebelling against God's providence and that he has given them every good thing, they break the relationship they had with God. It was free, it was open, it was one of partnership and companionship. We get this image of them in the garden together. But having sinned, they become separated from God. You know, the writer, he's painting a picture here. And the picture he kind of gives us of this brokenness is the idea that God can't even find them in the garden. He can't see them anymore. He says, where have you gone? I can't find you. And the writer of Genesis is trying to point out clearly that something has changed in their relationship. Something has become broken. And because of their sin, they are removed from Eden. And we no longer enjoy that full relationship with God. We have some of it in part through Christ, but we do not enjoy that full relationship and we need to recognize that our relationship with God is broken. It's not just our relationship with God that got damaged in the Garden of Eden. Our relationship with one another is broken. What is the first thing that happens after Adam eats of the fruit? He turns on Eve. He says it's her fault. He's, such a, he's a big lad, isn't he, Adam? It's her fault. And then he kind of almost blames it on God. He says, well, the woman you gave me. Do you see the implication? This is your fault. The woman you gave me. She made me do it. Adam, he thrashes out and he blames everyone around him. His relationship with Eve is broken. And if we look into chapter 4, we see a further extrapolation of how our relationships with one another are broken. What is the first significant act post Eden? It's the murder by one brother of another with Cain and Abel. In the fall, our relationships with one another are broken. You know, when Paul lists the fruits of the Spirit, he also lists the anti-fruits of the Spirit, if you will. And what you find in both these sections, the fruits and the anti-fruits, is that they're all relating to how we treat one another. The damage we do to one another. 
the restoration we should be doing with one another in the spirit. And look, if we look through the story of human history, uh, apart from maybe the last two centuries where we also add tearing the earth apart to this, it's the story of humankind, not one of warfare and violence. And we can sometimes sell each other the idea that, oh, we were only fighting to bring about peace. Is there ever a greater oxymoron? And look at the, the history of the British Empire. Are we not seeing this steady need to apologize to the world for our imperial colonial subjugation of so many people and cultures? And maybe you think, well, look, we're trying to fix this. We're getting there. We're doing the right thing. And then you look at South Africa. Well, there was a country that came out under the boot heel of a brutally oppressive culture, the culture of apartheid. I think, well, here's a great opportunity for a country to redefine itself, to rewrite itself with, with uh, moral ideas and democratic ideas at its heart. Well, I love South Africa. And I've been there a bunch of times. But what has happened is that corruption has come in, oppression is reintroduced, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, there is increased violence, there is increased xenophobia amongst blacks and coloreds and whites. So even when we get an opportunity to rewrite what has been so wrong, we seem unable to take it. It's kind of like everything is broken. But Dylan didn't teach us that. Genesis did. And we can see where our relationship with God has got broken. And we can see where our relationship with one another is broken and so evident in the everyday. But also our relationship with ourselves is broken. And has this been any more obvious than in today's culture? If we look into the, the verses 7 to 11, what do we see there? We see there the birth of shame. Adam is ashamed of himself. Eve is ashamed of herself. They see that they are naked and they're ashamed about this. And this is the very thing that God picks up on. Because this has never been an issue before. Adam and Eve have never been ashamed before. Yet they've always been unclothed. But in the fall, even their view of themselves becomes broken. In that they know shame. It's a fascinating thing, shame, because it's purely a human thing. I was watching a fascinating interview with Stephen Fry and Robin Williams, and they were, they were being interviewed by Parkinson, and I think it was about the mid-90s. And it's, it's kind of chaos, because Stephen Fry is this sort of, sort of polite English gentleman, and Robin Williams is this whirlwind of American chaos, and you put the two together, and it's just, yeah. But... Fry was on because he'd just written a book about bears, because, of course, Stephen Fry, he kind of does whatever he wants, uh, being a polymath. But his observation of these South American bears in Peru led him to consider his own life and matters that he had seen within himself. Because he, what he noted with, with the, trying to understand these animals was that creatures don't feel any shame. They don't feel any need to clothe themselves. They don't feel any need to harm themselves. They don't feel any need to ostracize themselves from others. And incredibly oddly for Stephen Fry, who is a very aggressive atheist, he said it made him consider the Genesis narrative and how it revealed the source of shame. We've even seen it in our house. It's the most curious thing. I remember one day coming down the stairs to find one of the kids sitting on the bottom stair. They're sort of like, oh, what's going on? What are you doing? I'm on the naughty step. So I'm thinking, of course, mum's put, you know, on the naughty step. No. Neither of us had. One of our kids had done something wrong, and because of how they felt this shame, they put themselves there. And how many of our young people look at themselves and feel ashamed of how they look and how they feel and hate who they are? Our relationship with our very selves is broken. 
And finally, what we see around us is that creation is broken. When God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, we see that the world is now different. The ground will have to be worked with difficulty. Weeds and thistles and thorns will oppose man. Women will have pain in childbirth. And what we begin to see is animal predating on animal. We see the natural disasters. We see tectonic plates ripping the earth apart and bruising up mountain ranges. I hadn't realized, I kind of Googled this, because I kind of thought, are tectonic plates good or bad? But apparently we're the only planet that has them. I thought all planets surely had them. We're the only planets that have these separate and moving tectonic plates. Don't ask me how they know that. But people that know stuff know this. We have plants that kill animals in horrible ways. And who can watch the images of crocodiles snatching bison from the edge of rivers, rivers and all thing? Ooh. Nobody looks at that and thinks it's a good thing. And we call it the cycle of life. But there seems to be this sense that that's not how Eden was and how God wants things to be. You know, we have diseases that, that have no good natural habitat. Some diseases are natural, some don't seem to be. And don't get me started on wasps and nettles. Though I, I, I was really heartbroken because I found an article that said that wasps are important, and that broke my heart. But there's a distinct element to nature that is red and tooth and claw, that is attritional. And it stands opposed to what God would like it to be. And we'll look at that in a wee bit. So Dylan sings, everything is broken. And is he so wrong? But that's not the whole story here in Genesis 3. Tucked away in this passage is hope. In fact, tucked away in, in here is what theologians call the proto-evangelion. Now, to get her some sense of that, uh, proto, prototype, you know, it's the beginning. It's the first, it's the, the first seed. Evangelion, for those of you who are Greek scholars, I appreciate there's many amongst us. This is where we get evangelist or evangelism from. It's the bringing of good news. So right in this little passage, we have this beginning of good news, the first good news, the seed of good news. There is a future hope spoken about here by God. And many feel that this is the first time we hear about Jesus. And Jesus who will come to restore all things. What are we reading? Verse 15. God says this. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now in the language here we get two things. We get the general eye that people will hate snakes and snakes will go around attacking people. But it also seems to be speaking about a specific incidence as well. Now, if you remember what the serpent represents here in the garden, it's i.e. Satan and sin, then we begin to get a sense of what is happening here. And looking forward to Jesus and the Gospels, we see how this very first prophecy is fulfilled. We have that moment when, through the works of the devil, and we see it clearly in the heart of Judas and other places, what we see is Christ crucified. The snake has struck But in the resurrection from the dead and the ascension to the right hand of the Father, we see death defeated, we see sin defeated, and we see all that was broken in the garden going on to be restored. And so what we see is that he who has been struck in the heel will go on to strike the head of Satan and sin and crush him. So even in this passage of brokenness, because you could read this and you could leave here totally depressed, but even in this passage of brokenness, we see that God is already, from the very beginning, working out his plan to restore all that was broken. He will deal with the sin of Adam. He will deal with the death that that has brought. And if we look into Isaiah 11 and 65 in Revelation, we see that even the broken earth will be restored. In this world, you put a, a wolf and, and a lion together in the same room as a lamb, what's going to happen? 
a knife and fork and a napkin and some salt and pepper will be brought out. But not in the restored heaven and earth. Because in the prophecies that we see here, we see that the lion will lie with the lamb, that the wolf will lie with the lamb. And if we go into the book of Jeremiah, what we actually see is the lion, the wolf, the leopard. These are the very images of, of the enemies of God's people. And we will see all these things restored back to Eden state and they will be at peace together. I love watching the repair shop. I know it's afternoon TV and I should be working, but I watch a wee bit of it. And you've got Jay Blades. I don't know if you've seen Jay Blades. And he restores people's bits of furniture from these sort of old, raggedy, tired out things, these beautiful new sort of creations. But the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter how good Jay Blades is, he cannot restore creation, he cannot restore our relationships with ourselves, one another, or God. He will come out short. He cannot repair these broken things. So that there's no human external agent can repair these things for you. And we can't repair them for ourselves. So I have lots of grey hair in my beard. It's a sign that I'm dying. My hair pigment has given up the ghost. It's had enough. It's a sign that I'm going on to die. So uh, not just is it dying. So I thought, well, I want to restore this myself. So I sat last night with my wife and I restored my beard. I know some of you are thinking, how luxuriant that beard looks this morning, David. So we sat together. Look at it. It's like the beard of a 25-year-old. So I thought, I can at least restore some of the natural color of my beard. And we got the old just for men out and we went to work on it. But the truth is that I haven't restored my beard. I've simply painted over the top of it. Already now, like since last night, already new grey hair is pushing out from my skin. My follicles are still dead in pigment. I've simply painted them. You know, I can't even restore properly the colour of my beard. What chance have I got of restoring my relationship with God, with, with my fellow human, and with myself. How helpless I am in the face of the brokenness. But praise God. Praise God. He has sent us someone that can fix it, that can restore it, that can bring all the brokenness and dispose of it and give us rebirth in Eden. He can fix the broken physical, the broken emotional, the broken spiritual. All things can and will be fully restored by and through him. How blessed are we to know him. And to have been called by him into his restored kingdom. In the midst of brokenness, God sows hope. The one who crushed the head of the snake offers each and every one of us that same restored glory in part now in this life and fully in the next. To be part of that living kingdom of God in the now and to dwell in it fully in the life to come. You know, we don't gather tomorrow to mourn. Not for Wesley, our brother who sat here week after week. We don't gather to mourn. We gather to say farewell as he departs into the fully restored relationship with God. We come to celebrate tomorrow. We are sad for us. That's a simple fact. We're sad for us because we lose a brother and a friend and a family member. But we are not sad for him. For he will be fully restored. How incredible is that? How blessed are we that this can be our life. Dylan may write, everything is broken. But praise God that everything will be restored in Jesus. Amen and amen. God 
ransom son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One, Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb. Over sinners slain close our service now with the prayer uh, affiliated with St. Patrick. May the strength of God pilot us. May the power of God preserve us. May the wisdom of God instruct us. May the hand of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the shield of God defend us. May the host of God guard us against the snares of the evil ones, against temptations of the world. May Christ be with us, may Christ be before us, may Christ be in us, Christ be over all. May thy salvation, Lord, always be ours, this day, O Lord, and evermore. Amen. <laughs>